Good afternoon, everyone. It's such a pleasure to join with you this afternoon for this very special occasion as we give a warm Pitzer welcome to award-winning director and producer, Lynn Novick. Lynn, welcome. Thank you. Our very own Nigel Boyle, Pitzer Professor of Political Studies and Director of the Institute for Global, Local Action and Study, iGLASS, will have the honor of moderating this dynamic and important conversation with Lynn and some very important additional guests today. Professor Boyle is responsible for de developing Pitzer's Inside Out Pathway to BA, the country's first degree-seeking prison education program where incarcerated inside students and outside students from the Claremont Colleges attend classes together in prison and are working toward earning a bachelor's degree. Like you too, I look forward to this incredibly powerful conversation. With that said, I turn to you, Professor Boyle. Thanks, Melvin. And I welcome all Pitzer alumni, current students, and the families of uh, current students to this event, featuring renowned filmmaker Lynn uh, Norwick. And I send a special welcome to the families of inside students who are tuning in. You are now part of the Pitzer community too, and we look forward to seeing you at events online and soon we hope uh, on Pitzer's campus uh, later in uh, 2021. Uh, we're in, at an exciting uh, moment uh, regarding both currently incarcerated and formerly incarcerated students being pipelined towards earning Pitzer BAs. Last December, we formally admitted as fully matriculated students a cohort from CRC prison in Norco. We anticipate these students completing their BAs by the end of 2021. Our BA program at CRC rests on inside out curriculum, as uh, Melvin uh, noted, um, with equal numbers of uh, uh, inside students and outside students in the same classes. Students do the same work and earn the same credit uh, without charge to the inside students, thanks to an enlightened decision by the Pitzer Board of Trustees. Our panelist, Jewel Hall, is a, a graduate uh, of another top liberal arts colleague, Bard. And we here at Pitzer have long been in awe of the Bard Prison Initiative, a shining light in the wilderness uh, that has been higher education in prison since the notorious 1994 uh, crime bill. But ours is the first ever built on inside out curriculum and we look forward to comparing notes on, on the different curricular and pedagogical models that are involved. Pitzer has long had a mechanism for formerly incarcerated students to earn Pitzer degrees through our new resource program for non-traditional age students, people who spent their years 18 to 25 somewhere else than college, raising kids in the military uh, in, or in prison. Some of you will have heard me boast in the past about Hippie Pitzer College being the only college in the country that's ha that has had veterans from all four branches of the military, Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marines, win Fulbrights as graduating Pitzer NRS seniors. Similarly, the college now boasts a line of illustrious NRS alumni who were formerly incarcerated, from Marilyn Ralston, who, Ralston, who won a Coro Fellowship after uh, graduation, and uh, is the 2020 Pitzer Distinguished Alumni Award honoree. Richard Roderick, whose incarceration was the subject of a, a well-known film, uh, Cooler Brat Bandits, now a filmmaker in his own right and a program coordinator at Columbia University in New York. Pitzer is now actually forming a, an alumni association chapter of formerly incarcerated students, to which there will soon be 10 new eligible members. The eight uh, uh, BA students at CRC that will graduate in 2021, plus two formerly incarcerated students who will graduate as NRS students this year and who are our other two panelists today, Leanne Neighbors and Michael Griggs. Pitzer's pipelines for currently incarcerated and formerly incarcerated students are in fact connected. First, for students at CRC who will be released prior to their completing their BA, those students will be able to complete their degrees as outside uh, NRS students. Secondly, formerly incarcerated students, including Michael and Leanne, have themselves now been outside students in our Inside Out classes. So our format today is going to involve viewing four short clips from uh, Lynn Novick's marvelous film, um, after each of which we will have a Q&A moderated by myself or by Jewel Hall. And it's after the last clip that we will turn to questions posed by the audience today, as well as those uh, posed by uh, some of our Inside students. And if you can please use the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen uh, to uh, uh, post questions to us. But now uh, you will, we will look at the first clip. Uh, 
I've been incarcerated for 13 years. And from my experience, I can tell you, prison is here to punish us. Um, it's here to warehouse us. But it's not about um, rehabilitating. It's not about creating um, productive beings. It just isn't. Call me Ishmael. Some years ago, never mind how long precisely. I have a little or no money in my purse and nothing particular to interest me on the shore. I thought I would sell about a little to see the watery part of the world. I'm taking Moby Dick. Oh, that's a really interesting class. The whole first paragraph we had to memorize. And each one of us had to recite in front of the rest of the class. You would see another guy in the class in the yard, and we would be like, um, hey, call me Ishmael, and he would go through it, and I would go through it, and we'd point out where we didn't match. I thought I would sail about a little and see the watery part of the world. Is the way I have of regulating the spleen and try, and uh, regulating the... Is the way I have of driving off the spleen and regulating the circulation. Whenever I find myself going grim about the mouth, whenever it is a damp, drizzly November in my soul, whenever I find myself involuntarily pausing before coffin warehouses and bringing up the rear of every funeral I meet, and especially whenever my high post gets such an upper hand of me that it requires a strong moral principle to prevent me from deliberately stepping out into the streets and methodically knocking people's hats off their heads, then I account it high time to get to see as soon as I can. How would you feel about that? We got to remember that the crisis that the United States was in in the early 1930s was a global economic crisis. And that crisis led to the rise of all kinds of anti-democratic regimes all over the world. And what Roosevelt's concerned about is the possibility that this could happen in the United States. We are not a part of the prison system. We are a college who happens to have classes inside a prison. Unlike other schools, it has bars, it has gates that close and open, it has doors that must be locked. Although we say school building, it's not a traditional school building. Although what we do inside the school building is traditional college work. One of the things that's always been most important to us is the institution's adamance that these students, the incarcerated students, are no different from any other. And in many ways, BPI is simply a very simple kind of experiment, which is what happens when we provide the kinds of education that typically in the United States are only afforded to the children of the lucky or the entitled or the rich to others. Thank you.
not get rid of any draft. So you can see there's a lot of rewrites. I spend most of my time in the school building. Um, if I'm in the cell, more often than not, I'm either reading, writing, or sleeping. Um, this is this is a cell. This is not a place that I live in. Well, as you can see, there's no pictures or posters on the wall at all. I keep this bare. I don't forget that this is prison, even when I'm working. Because at some point, being an officer, he's going to walk past this cell. I'm going to hear the keys jangling on his belt. And he might stop by that cell and look through that window there. And so I don't forget. You never forget. I do most of my work at night because it's a dorm, it's an open space. There are a lot of distractions, you know, guys walking around, talking loudly. It's not always easy to uh, focus on schoolwork, so I may start, start a lot of my work maybe at 11 at night and go to bed 2, 3 in the morning. I try to be as organized as I can be in such a small space. So, I, you know, I utilize like little folders and things. Uh, miscellaneous papers. Papers for every semester, for every class, for the last five years. I came in when I was 16. I got my GED on Rikers Island in 2005. A friend of mine forced me into the program, which is probably the kindest, most loving thing anyone has ever done for me. It was forced me to apply to this program. Just all textbooks, math, science, and then, of course, Spanish is invading my life. So that's my, for the next two and a half years, it will be Spanish, biology, math. I keep myself very Spartan and school-oriented as a buffer against prison life. Prison can get inside of you, it's invasive, and I try to keep it out. And school is by one of the means that I keep it out. I majored in German studies. The language was so hard. However, now, I love to read about American news in German. One of the things that really attracted me about Germany was its historical mistake and then the manner in which it tried to really make up for that mistake. This is my cell. This is where I uh, rest my head, uh, get my thoughts together, do my schoolwork. You have my sink, uh, my window. You see, I don't have much of a view of much out there, but it's all right. Definitely look forward to having a different environment when I get out. Now I gotta make the most of what I have, you know? The overwhelming majority of our students will be sent back to the communities typically from which they came and will engage with their families and those communities, and they will be better at that when they're educated in a way that's meaningful to them. 
So the question is, what does that do to the fact that we have this foundational document, which itself is premised on a contradiction? Yeah, Giovanni. Now, I was just thinking about uh, this quote from a song of myself. I am vast, I contain multitudes. And I think that says it all, where there's this acknowledgement that the individual is not just this set personality, this set uh, being, his relationship to everyone else and everything else in the world constitutes this oneness. What I do today may affect what someone is capable of doing tomorrow or vice versa. You know, keep trying to bring this back to what makes these documents foundational to us as a nation and what are manifestos. So I didn't get everyone's manifestos. I'm calling it manifesto. It's really a declaration. I have yours. What did you have to think about when you wrote your declaration? It was personal for me because um, my sister sent me a letter and she wrote in a way that Nowadays, the little teens out there, they use text messaging, the funny words, and it broke my heart. After I came to college and I learned the English language, you know, I became a gra grammar police. <laughs> so I wanted to arrest her. <laughs> so, I, <laughs> so I wrote the Declaration of um, Inflection for her. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that words are our greatest gifts, that they are endowed with stupendous powers, that among these are documentation, communication, and expression that whenever any form of texting becomes destructive of our language, it is the right of said technology to revise it and enlighten its user. When lucidity is bedimmed by impatience, which in turn spawns ignorance, it is our right, it is our duty to reinvent texting and to provide correct grounds for our majestic language. We mutually pledge to hold Twitter in contempt forever. So uh, I hope that has whetted the appetite of those of you that might not have seen uh, the film yet, uh, or if there's people like myself who watched it in fragmentary form, I urge you to do what I did the other night and watch all four hours, binge watch it uh, in one setting. The cumulative power is extraordinary. Anyway, the first part of our discussion now is gonna be, involve uh, Lynn Novick and Jewel Hall. So let me do the formal introductions and then we'll get into it. Uh, Lynn Novick is a, an Emmy, Peabody, and Alfred I. DuPont Columbia award-winning docu uh, documentary filmmaker. For 30 years, she has been directing and producing landmark documentary films about American culture, history, politics, sports, art, and, the mu and music for PBS. In collaboration with Ken Burns, she has created more than 80 hours of programming, including the Vietnam War, baseball, jazz, Frank Lloyd Wright, the war, and prohibition. College Behind Bars is uh, Novick's solo directorial debut. Jewel Hall, um, uh, uh, welcome Jewel, uh, uh, graduated from Bard College in 2011, as you've now heard, with a BA in German studies. He has volunteered at the Brownsville Community Justice Center, where he tutored uh, Justin's involved youth. He's also worked at the Ford Foundation, where he provided data analysis and strategy development for its work around gender, racial, and ethnic justice. Currently, Jewel works for the Ascendium Education Group as a program officer who funds high quality post-secondary educational programs in prisons around the nation. So I'd like to welcome both uh, Lynn and uh, Jewel. And if I can just start with uh, Lynn, you know, you've made films on big topics, Vietnam War, jazz, why College Behind Bars? It was a bit of a departure in that most of the films I've made with Ken Burns have been historical, looking back at, you know, events of the past and trying to understand them through the perspective of the present. And this was a story that was unfolding as we were filming it. Um, my producer and partner, Sarah Botstein, and I had the opportunity to visit a Bard Prison Initiative classroom in 2012 to do an event kind of like this, to show clips from our film and to talk with the students about the work. It was about the film we made about prohibition. And it was my first time inside a maximum security prison and first time inside a college classroom inside a prison. And the experience was really extraordinary for us, just seeing what you've just seen on screen and many people here already also know, uh, the level of discourse, the seriousness of the students, the kind of intellectual rigor, the passion for learning and for ideas. We had the most extraordinary conversation with those students and we left that classroom just kind of blown away with what we had seen and also concerned that we didn't know that this was happening and we felt the world needed to see it to really appreciate what's possible and why this should be in every, you know, this, this shouldn't be a rare, a rare occurrence. 
And so the next year I actually taught in the program myself for a, a half a semester. And then Sarah and I began trying to develop the film. And one of the first things we had to do was to convince the Department of Corrections and the Bard Prison Initiative to even consider this possibility. And then we had to try to get to know some of the students and see if they were interested in participating and collaborating with us on making the film. So I was thinking today, I mean, while we were watching, Jewel and I first met uh, more than seven years ago. We were at the very beginning, we hadn't started filming, we were just developing the project. It was before the scene that you saw that we filmed, a lot of groundwork had to be laid for us to actually make the film. And it was four years of filming. We wanted to show people going from beginning the BARD program to graduation, and that could take three or four years. So that's in a short, uh, not a very short answer, but um, it was an incredible experience for me, for Sarah, for our team to get to know Jewel and the other students uh, you see in the film and to just gain a renewed appreciation for the value of education, how transformative it, how transformative it is. And you know what, ask, I guess it just, it, it provokes so many questions. You know, what is prison for? Who has access to education? Why is our society organized the way it is? we're still you know, wrestling with those questions. So Jewel, yeah, can you describe your participation in, in this project and uh, how it maybe has shaped your idea about the transformative power of education? Well, I have been incarcerated since 1993 when uh, Pell, Pell was uh, stripped from people incarcerated and I saw colleges leave and the void that was left in prison. I actually dedicated myself to a form of self-education where I engage the population uh, to fill that void. So uh, I would say 11 years later, I got into BPI. It was a natural outgrowth for me. Uh, and I would say, what, uh, six years after that, when I, when I met Lynn and Lynn asked me, would I participate in this film? There was no question in my mind. Now I wanna be clear, I don't like to hear my voice over a recording. I don't like watching myself on film, but I want to say that I knew there was something special going on with the Bard Prison Initiative that the world didn't have the chance to see. And when, Lip, when Lynn presented this project, I said, wow, this is the opportunity. And I just want to add it, the, the feedback, the rapport, the, the, the appreciation for this film globally has been really phenomenal. I am so humbled, but I will say I knew it would happen. Um, so. And I, if I could just jump in and say that, you know, there really are no words for us to describe our gratitude to Jewel and the other students for opening themselves to this process and being coming on the journey with us and letting us travel on their journey because it's their story. And we're just, there really is no way to express our gratitude and just what an incredible experience it's Part of that opening, uh, some of the most powerful parts of the film was where, where you have uh, the students talk about their relationship with their parents. Uh, in some instances, parents were, were featured in this as well. And this kind of recurring theme of, you know, through redemption, you know, making par parents proud. But I want to ask you about one uh, scene in the film. It's where um, there's this very explosive criticism, criticism of the very idea of free college education for, for, for criminals. And it was posed by the mother of one of the students, um, uh, Tamika Graham's uh, mom. Can you, can you say a little bit about, about that, that segment? Oh. And do, do you think this kind of illustrates the sort of fragility of uh, uh, um, uh, this sort of programming? I wanna just interrupt quickly, Nigel, respectfully. Yes. We like to use people first language. Yes. So it's people who are incarcerated and not criminals. Yes, indeed. I was actually using Tamika Graham's mom's uh, line there, but you're quite correct, Jules. Thank you. Um, yes, for those of you who haven't seen, this is in episode three. And, um, you know, we wanted very much in the film to rep represent the idea that this is at the time we were making the film. And I actually believe much less so now, and we'll get to that later. I think in our conversation, there was a lot of controversy about whether people who were incarcerated, quote unquote, deserved access to education, even though education is the single most effective way for people who are incarcerated to prepare themselves to come back to the world and be productive citizens. So, you know, um, there's a lot of rhetoric around uh, punishment and retribution and education being some kind of privilege as opposed to a right. And yes, I mean, when we started working on the film, it was a much more pervasive kind of discourse that we heard. I don't think we hear it as much right now, which I think is a really positive sign. But in the film, we, we happen to be able to film um, Tamika and her mom having this exact conversation, which did turn into an argument. 
and was very painful for both of them. Um, but I'm happy to say that in the ensuing several years since that scene was filmed, Tamika's mom, she came to her graduation. She's incredibly proud of her daughter and what she has accomplished. And she really came to actually appreciate much more than she did before how education is so important for everybody. So it's, that's been actually a beautiful journey to see, but it was important to us to include that in the film. Thanks, Liam. So I have a question for Jewel now as well. Uh, like many others that become involved with prison education, I'm constantly impressed by the, the breadth of intellectual interests that, that um, people inside uh, have. You could have studied uh, urban sociology in New York City. There's plenty there to study, but you chose to learn German and study German labor migration policy. We saw other bad students learning Chinese, classics. I can give you similar stories about the, the breadth of intellectual interests of our inside students. Uh, can you explain wh where this intellectual curiosity comes from and maybe give a sense of, of, of where this comes from with uh, other inside students? Well, I wanna say that I, I would love to unpack this idea of intellectual curiosity and its relation to maybe New York City urban uh, I, I will quote uh, my, my, my alum in the film when he quoted uh, Walt Whitman in the song of myself. I am vastness. I contain multitudes. So I don't think there's one type of education or intellectual interest that we're going to find amongst people incarcerated. In fact, I encourage us, this is why I say I, I would love to investigate where the notion of, of me studying uh, urban rather than German comes from, because I actually feel that if we take the historical context of the school to prison pipeline, uh, we have a large segment and in my work, I find it to be 1.3 million people who are incarcerated, ready to take on these uh, uh, stringent studies, but haven't been given the opportunity in prison or while they was home. So it's a way in which we uh, should not limit human potential to circumstance. But to get a little bit more uh, specific to what I believe the idea of your question was, I have been doing a lot of study about World War II, one of the most important events in world history. So it just really brought my attention to Germany. And uh, I'm so grateful that I did because you're right, I just uh, latched to it. It became a passion for me. Uh, I still have my German app on my phone where I study German. And uh, one other thing that I said in the film that attracted me was the idea that Germany actually made a mistake, or I would say it's even more than a mistake, uh, something really horrific, but it did the work. You know, redemption is, a, is a, a, a touchy word for me as well, but nonetheless, it did the work to try to face up to its own responsibility. And that just really sits with me uh, strongly. Thanks a lot, Jewel. Uh, we're now going to go to the second uh, clip, and after that, Jewel will moderate a discussion involving uh, Leanne and Michael. So, uh, but please uh, uh, watch this second clip now. This is my third full semester. Bar just gets progressively harder. I had a professor tell us, you know, I teach college and I teach to the best students in the most elite universities in the country. And that's what I'm going to do here. Let's get started. When someone tells you that it's a whole new day. I was just thinking you have this iris population who's kind of against the role of government in their lives. And yet they seem to be the ones advocating for like greater government presence in some sense? Like, how, how is that? Can you speak about that tension? It's, it's about power okay. and using power to actually both protect themselves, but also to secure their position within the greater urban you know, um, complex. Several of you have in the past referenced things like W.B. Du Bois' double consciousness, right? But there's no reason not to extend that metaphor to the Irish. OK, so they constantly have to negotiate or renegotiate this tension? The tension is obvious for us. Um, but, but in fact, like Du Bois double consciousness, it's not that you know, one day you're one thing and the next day you're the next. It's in fact actually that there are two emotional, personal, communal struggles happening within you. 
there are things that you know I take for granted um, when I'm teaching at MIT um, that I can just do that I can't do here. The mixed media that you'll use inside a classroom at an elite institution that I can't reproduce here. Here, you go back to a more basic teaching structure. So what else I have, you know? So U1, A1, U2, A2, so U3, A3, and plus now U4, A4, okay? Our students in BPI show up to class extraordinarily well prepared. And so a lot of the, that sort of gimmickry that we need, we don't need here as much because actually everyone's done the reading. Essentially what you're doing is you're combining all of the components yes, of your I'm gonna, vector yeah, and you Yeah, I'm going to just put this, you see, I just use commutativity, you know, and so you're this collecting one, the terms. and this one together, you know, so that's what I'm looking for, okay? okay. That's what I'm looking for. This is a You call already stopped or Zaishua EVA. Che Yi Jing Ting Zai Ting Che Chang La. Ting Che. There you go. Thank you. The majority of prisoners in New York State come from New York City. And they come from the worst neighborhoods in New York City. That also have the worst schools in New York City. That have the lowest quality of education in New York City. And then they wound up in prison. College was not something that was on their radar. Gene therapy. Let's kind of sketch out the, the uh, terrain of, of what we're talking about here. People trying to get in the BARD, they never know what it is like until they get in. We try to convince someone that this is worth doing. They say, well, you know, I don't want to be up all night. They're like, look at you guys, but it's worth it. And they say, why? And you can't answer that question because it's not something you know until you get in the classroom with really, really great professors and they start teaching you how smart you are. Carla, so we're still talking about why this is such a matter of heated ethical debate. Well, one of the main concerns with stem cells is that there's this right that future generations have that we will be basically impeding. Terrific, very well put. BPI was the most challenging thing I've ever undertaken academically. Before then, everything I did academically was easy. That wasn't. But as I struggled and I worked hard and I, and I started taking my education to another level, I started kind of feeling cheated. Cheated by my early education, by my high school education. The fact that it wasn't challenging enough there is a, a dual educational system in this country. One for individuals who will rule and one for everyone else. And there's something inherently wrong and short-sighted in this because it takes for granted all the potential that lies at that other level. That they never get an opportunity to meet their potential. And what's the ramification of that for American society? Forced to, to face the reality of our condition. The class that I'm teaching now is the first year seminar. It's a mix of literature, philosophy, politi political science, history. It's a lot of different things. Bureaucracy doesn't go along with democracy because it doesn't give the right representation for the people. They think that socialism should be the way the way society goes through through bureaucracy because um, it's through the economy. You're on the right track. 
but I want to see, does somebody else get that same thing from it? They wanted to use socialism towards um, democracy uh -huh. so that they could think that was their own choice, like so they could think it was autonomous. This is why industrialization and bureaucracy is good for social harmony. So by them explaining it, people would think like, oh, okay, that makes sense. So yeah, let's do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That class is probably like the most challenging. But um, I don't know, what y'all think? I hate it. I don't know. I got an A minus slash B plus. No, so. I don't think I should use hate. Okay, I just really don't like it. This semester is definitely harder than last semester. There's a lot more material, and you have to go like deeper, and it's a lot more of like um, your own thoughts. I was still surprised because like I couldn't believe that I was capable of doing that. Like the work that it was giving mm -hmm. us was hard. And I'm like, I did that really. It just causes you to think. It causes you to look at the United States differently. Politics. It causes you to look at mm -hmm. politics differently. It just, cool. it just alters your mind altogether. It changes your whole outlook on the world, period. You know, knowing that this is not the end for you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I, I really like that clip. It really captures uh, the breadth of the work that uh, these students are doing in prison. Not just BPI students, but uh, students at Pitzer uh, and, and many, many other parts of the nation. I would like to just flag that one thing that I think is not really captured there, that is the camaraderie between students that is so unheard of in prison. People don't come together and work together. Prison breeds us to think of ourselves as individual entities and following the rules. You know, with that in mind, I would like to introduce our two panelists who are also people who have been incarcerated and taken uh, uh, the PITSA program. And I would love to compare notes with uh, Leanne Neighbors and Michael Gribbs, Griggs, excuse me. Uh, Leanne Neighbors was a new resource student before going to PITSA College. While a student, she has worked as an office manager at a counseling center and as a staff member for the Claremont College's Office of Consortial Academic Cooperation. She will graduate with a degree in psychology in May. Oh, that's, that looks good. And she is completing the final round of a Fulbright scholarship to, to Ireland. Yes, kudos to you. Leanne will become the first ever formerly incarcerated Fulbright scholar for Pitzer. She also serves on the board of Crossroads Incorporated and intends to become a clinical licensed social worker. Welcome, Leanne. We will also be joined by Michael Griggs. Michael Griggs first earned his associate's degree in social and behavior science while incarcerated. He is now a senior at Pitzer College and will complete his self-designed social justice uh, major this summer. So fabulous. I think that's very important, self-design. In addition to being a student, he is a plumber in the local 778, a labor union in Los Angeles. He also sits on the board of the Miguel Contreras Foundation, is, is a eyeglass fellow at Pizza. Welcome, Michael. Are you muted? Are you with us? Thank you, Joel. Thank, uh, thank you for the uh, introduction and thank you for you know, uh, just allowing us to document, you know, your your story and, and watch it. And I know it's like very vulnerable and, you know, some of my most vulnerable times were inside prison. So I appreciate it. And thank you for the introduction. You're welcome. And Leanne, so happy to have you. Thank you for having me. And I appreciate the opportunity to be a part of this panel. So I wanna just jump into some of the questions that have been always at top of mind for me. One of, it, one of them is, I would love for either you, either of you to discuss how was the Pitzer College program to other students or other people incarcerated, not just the students. So with BPI, we had this phenomenon where uh, in the beginning, everybody was like, I don't wanna to go to BPI, that work is too hard. But then within a time when people saw how uh, many of the students were taking leadership roles in the facility itself, they wanted to be part of that. 
So could uh, both of you maybe briefly discuss the impact of the program on other students in incarcerated at the facilities you were at? Yeah, so uh, I could touch on it first. Um, so unfortunately, I was not able to uh, participate in Pitzer's uh, current you know, pathway to BA program. Um, I was part of a different model of a correspondence course model. And uh, definitely I'm envious of these guys who are, who are participating in this inside out curriculum where they, where they mix a classroom, 10 incarcerated individuals along with 10, um, 10 or more uh, um, outside students. And then it, it, get, it creates a mixture of dialogue and exchange of ideas and you know, breaking of barriers and stereotypes. Um, so definitely the correspondence uh, model for me, uh, you know, I was, a, I was a student, I was a teacher, I was a tutor, and you know, I was my own classmate as well. So, you know, I have these internal dialogues, but you know, it definitely lacked um, what Pitzer is doing nowadays. Leanne, would you might want to comment on the impact of the program to other people who weren't students in the facility? Yeah, so like Michael, I too, um, when I was in prison, um, had to do the college courses through correspondence. We didn't have, um, we don't, we didn't have the inside out model like um, the Norco prison has. And um, it was all doing everything on my own. Of course, inmates that were able to take correspondence courses, had to have um, someone who was gonna pay for their books. The courses were free in itself. However, um, you had to have someone on the outside basically helping you pay for these books. So of course it was exciting to be able to take the courses, but at the same time, there was no engagement with other students. Um, you just basically did everything on your own. So I, being at Pitzer, I've actually had the opportunity, like Nigel mentioned earlier, to um, engage with the inside out classes. I First in the spring of 2019, when we still had in-person classes, I actually went into Norco Prison as a Pitzer student, an outside student, um, which was super rewarding after, because I was released from prison actually 10 years ago this month. Monday will mark my 10 year anniversary um, after doing um, 17 years in prison. But so after not stepping in a prison for eight years, it was really um, at first very nervous, at, but at the same time, just super rewarding just to be able to see how it's done inside, um, being an outside person studying alongside with the men. And I mean, just, it was just a wonderful experience. And I know the guys inside truly appreciate being able to, you know, have that intellectual experience intellectually stimulating um, education along with those out with us outside students. And then I even went as far as letting them know that I was a formerly incarcerated person just to be transparent so that, I mean, I know they didn't expect to even hear that pr from one of the outside students, but yeah. I wanted to share that just to, you know, encourage them. Yeah, it's so, it's so interesting. Uh, with BPI, I took classes with actual students who were taking classes on the campus. I never forget one class was uh, Friedrich Nietzsche, one of the hardest classes I ever took, but I love Free, uh, uh, Nietzsche right now. But um, nonetheless, there was like Michael described an exchange of ideas. It broke down barriers between uh, us. And I, I also love your forthcomingness, uh, Leanne, because uh, people have, uh, the wrong impression about the 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 not only the, our histories as formerly incarcerated people, but what are we uh, are interested in and how do we engage? And a lot of people are surprised when I mention, "Oh my goodness, you were incarcerated." But uh, another point I would love love to investigate. Okay, uh, what? How has your college experience impacted your integration back into society? For me, I'm gonna tell you, you know, I don't want to down my coworkers. But uh, I learned that I, my success in the professional space has been my ability to write. 
And a lot of my coworkers don't write that well who went to traditional colleges. So is there one skill or critical thinking, math, something that you or Michael can point to that is really instrumental in your integration in society now? Yeah, I, I, if you take I, this I, one first. Oh, I'm sorry, if in the end. L ladies first this time. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, so actually before I started Pitzer, I started Pitzer at, in 2018. Um, I actually been working on the campus of Claremont School of Theology at the Counseling Center um, Nigel mentioned. I've been working there for the past 10 years um, managing that center. So I actually was already working with um, PhD and masters. Um, my colleagues were all masters. I was the only one that's like an undergraduate or I was actually in community college when I started working there. Um, so how it's actually helped impacted me is just one of my colleagues actually who was a professor, um, a former professor at Pitzer College knew about the new resources program and she's actually the one that told me about it because I didn't even know even though I was in the Claremont area I had no idea about the program or even the college but um, so it was actually seven years after um, being released that I started um, attending Pitzer. So it's just I think it's help me with my critical thinking skills, of course, and just being um, social, my socialization, because sometimes I feel like I'm socially awkward because I did come from being incarcerated and was there for so many years. So how to interact with um, my colleagues or just anybody in general that has higher education. But I think yeah, it's absolutely. helped me, it's helped me to grow and blossom actually. That's great, Michael. Uh, we, we are short on time, Mike. We might have a minute left. Can you close us out? Yeah. So, you know, um, Pitzer helped me in many ways in regards to navigating the world post-incarceration. First most, uh, first most, it uh, helped me become a student of the world and helped me develop, you know, critical thinking skills necessary for deeper understanding of social, economic, and political issues. But um, additionally, Pitzer has given me the social capital I never knew existed connecting to me to resources, expanding my network, and, more, and most importantly, empowering me to use my voice and education to affect community change. Hope oh, that was dude. concise. That was really concise and beautiful. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Leanne. And we will transition into the third clip of the film now. Thank you, everyone. This is the final day of the project, so to speak. So we wrote the project, and now we're going in front of three professors and have a discussion. The thesis for the project is that Americans in general have used the black body as an object of rhetoric to define their identities. Black people, for example, used the suffering black body. They used bodies in a way to force America to see this suffering so that you can empathize with their pain. We see this not only with Emmett Till, but we see it with the Black Lives Matter movement, with Mike Brown, um, with Tamir Rice. There's a lot of really powerful language, the idea of messianic. That's a really deliberate choice. It's a choice you made a long time ago and you've stayed with, right? This idea of the messianic black body. Benjamin says that we shouldn't look at history as linear, one event following another and then the other events are in the past. When he says messianic, he's saying that this past is constantly being resurrected. It's constantly re-emerging. Re well, when we take the black body, it's a container of all of this history of suffering and resistance. So we have a body of Mike Brown lying in the middle of the street for four and a half hours. But for many of the African-American activists who are seeing this body in the middle of the street, they're not just seeing Mike Brown. They're seeing all of the previous um, acts of, of um, indignities, injustice, 
And it's not just their personal experiences, but the entire quote unquote race. And I think messianic black bodies, it allows me to explain why, again, why African Americans um, can look at a black body and say, listen, that is all of this history and it's me. We need to draw things to a close. Are there Step outside for just a first couple first minutes. Yeah. Writing this project, I did feel hopeless. Seeing the, the, the body of Emmett Till, I mean, it, it, it's, I mean, it was just very sad. And, and all of that, it just became so much for me. I had to push the project away um, several, at several points during the process and just take a break because it was just heavy. It was just too much for me. So this is the afterword. During the course of my research, I developed a hyper-awareness of the many often insidious ways in which society disfigures the personhood of marginalized people. I noticed the attempt of so many to lump disparate elements into the category of blackness or some other category meant to house the unworthy, categories such as offender or inmate. It is difficult to live, to function in one of these categories. It begins to feel like scurf that one cannot scrub clean from the body. I am a, quote, irredeemable, trapped in one of these crippling categories for the undeserving. I'm reluctant to use the word anger. In America, anger and blackness and offender is considered a volatile mixture. But everyone, every single one of us should seethe when injustice is rampant and bodies are falling and the nation is divided about whether or not the losses of Eric Garner, of Laquan McDonald, of Mike Brown, of Trayvon Martin, insert here, are worth mourning. Mourning is not a question of race and bodies. It is a question of humanity. Let me say it plainly. The black body is a prison of flesh, and the truth is unforgiving. African Americans can no more relinquish their signifying black bodies than they can change the history of this nation. But they must continue to demand. Congratulations, Rodney. The registrar does not allow us to give the grade that we want to give to it, but uh, which would have been an A plus, but since the registrar doesn't allow it, you get an A. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome. Great stuff, great stuff. So um, I'd now, uh, I, I referenced earlier, both Lynn and Jewel essentially being part of a movement. Uh, and I'd like to ask uh, each of you, um, I, I almost hesitate to say this, but we may be at the, the moment that Michelle Alexander called for in the new Jim Crow, a great awakening, specific term she used. Lynn, your film contributed powerfully to the discussion that has led to the restoration of Pell Grant funding, at least uh, in the near future. And Jewel, now you are uh, among a new crop of uh, formerly incarcerated students who are themselves working uh, in uh, advocacy groups, in uh, other sorts of organizations that are seeking to promote opportunities for uh, higher education inside prisons. But can I ask each, each of you what you see as the obstacles and the opportunities uh, for, uh, regarding moving ahead for um, uh, uh, BA uh, uh, education in prisons? Jewel? Uh, you could go first, Lynn, please. Okay. Um, yeah, well, I mean, just to say, first of all, I, I, I raised my hand before the clip played before because I wanted to explain that we sort of drop you into a scene from the end of, this, of the series where Rodney is defending his senior project. We didn't quite explain. It's a year long research project. That's the culmination of the bachelor's degree and Jewel also has a magnificent senior project. Um, and it just sort of, we, we include that clip here just to speak to the kind of um, ambition of the students and the, and the opportunity to realize that ambition. And that kind of leads me into the answer to your question, because um, you know we are at this uh, inflection point or um, watershed, you know, where there's this um, 
federal support is going to open in the next few years where students who are incarcerated will have access to Pell Grants, which they should have had all along because it's a program based on financial need. And so the question is, what kind of education will be made available will they have access to? And will that be the correspondence courses? Or, you know, I hate to use this term, but there were sort of diploma mills in the prior iteration where, you know, there were for-profit entities that came in, provided very subpar education that wasn't the kind of in-person instruction that you've just seen in the film and that you guys are doing with the programs that you have. And I guess, you know, in, in starting the film, I don't think I quite realized that when the, this would happen, I hoped it would, but now it's incumbent upon all of us to really keep the pressure on and keep the conversation going about not um, lowering expectations and having high standards and rigorous programs and in-person instruction. And, you know, I think the way Pell Restoration was structured and for everyone who may not know that it happened in the, the last, the very end of the last um, Legislative congressional session. session as part of a big spending bill that Pell Restoration for everybody was included without any limitations. And that's fantastic. And they eliminated um, for-profit institutions from participating. So that's good, I think. But again, what kind of college, what does that mean you know, to, to have programs like Pitzer and BPI made available to everyone who, who wants them, I think is essential. Yes, I agree with you, Lynn. Uh, I, with all that you said, there's one thing that I, there's a couple of things that I would add, of course. One, uh, first of all, thank you for that question, Nigel, because you phrased it in a way that I think is very important. And that is one, there are multiple opportunities here. Uh, we feel as if the, and that is advocates, we feel as if uh, the reinstatement of Pell is a informal or formal signal that this type of work is encouraged, that people who are incarcerated will be uh, uh, able to have the opportunities as students on the streets to take these programs. With that said, it's important to understand that uh, the obstacles that lay in the way one of them, of course, is COVID. COVID has really uh, ravaged uh, hep, higher ed in prison. Two is uh, we need to create career pathways based on access to college education and multiple opportunities. I really believe, you know, from my engagement with people incarcerated, there are not only people who are willing to engage the liberal arts, but there's people who want to take the more post-secondary uh, form of welding, et cetera. And the facilities that I resided in, the welding shops were woefully inadequate. There wasn't a pathway to, to apprenticeship so that when a person is released that they will be able to see, receive employment. So we need to make sure that we create the same type of career pathways that students are introduced to once they're in, uh, 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 on a campus to, to people who are incarcerated. Uh, and this will do great good for our society. If the advocates who were uh, incarcerated and home now are any indication that I believe they are, people are going to be released and continue to contribute and uh, be productive members of society. There's one other big point that Nigel touched on earlier, uh, I believe, and that is the infrastructure of corrections. Corrections do not have the infrastructure to manage these programs. And I, I commend uh, correction officials because many of them are supportive, but it's just the facility itself doesn't allow for Wi-Fi or there's limited classroom space. So we really need to uh, think about how we could get corrections to, to build up its infrastructure to support these type of programs. So that, I'll leave it there. Those are just a couple of answers to that question. Well, Jewel, you've hit on <laughs> a couple of things if you're preoccupying me lately, uh, including how we do uh, Zoom-based uh, courses using learning management, management systems so that our inside students get exactly the same resources as our outside students if they're in the same class. These are big challenges. Um, but can I come back to each of you on this question of the quality of the education that is going to be uh, uh, um, uh, available? Because I think what Bard has done and what Pitts has done, you know, we're, we're doing kind of a full Monty. We're doing great liberal arts education. Um, um, but 
uh, uh, is that uh, likely to, to, to be prominent uh, as, as, uh, uh, as we hope higher education expands uh, as a result of the Pell Grant uh, funding? Do you think there's a danger that what, what will happen is the kind of lowest common denominator sorts of uh, higher education? Well, there's the potential for that, of course. You know, I, I really feel like, you know, uh, I'm a liberal to the core. I think the, the, the system is going to manage itself. I think if we just keep opportunities open, that that lower grade education will not survive. In my view, of course, we have to be considerate that these are marginalized, vulnerable populations. But I think if we take higher ed as writ large as the lead, we're being a good space. And that isn't, you know, I'm very critical of higher ed writ large as well. You know, uh, we think that you know, uh, universities and schools need to put resources and open their campuses up as well. So this is a multi-sector effort, but I, I do believe that uh, the free market and uh, a, a keen eye to the human rights and the uh, surveillance issues and things that are uh, engaged on a regular university should be uh, setting the tone for how college is being uh, conducted inside a prison. So I'm not too much worried about the quality as long as we're providing uh, opportunity to multiple assets. Everyone wouldn't want liberal arts. Some people may want to do welding, but we need to make sure that that breadth of opportunity exists in the prison space as well. Yeah, I, I agree completely. I think I've heard uh, Max Kenner, the director and founder of BPI say something similar, which is sort of the way that for help me think about it is we should have the same range of opportunities inside and out. So like Jewel was saying, maybe someone wants to do computer science or they want to take a business course or whatever it is, the same range of opportunities should be available. And we should really envision, first of all, we should not have nearly as many people as we do have incarcerated or in the criminal justice system. And that's another whole conversation, but they're not unrelated because, you know, we have to solve all these problems in different ways and they're overlapping and related. But when it comes to education, um, I think the biggest danger that I see or the you know, risk is just underestimating the potential of people and therefore assuming that they wouldn't want to study certain topics or they wouldn't be able to manage certain level of academic rigor, you know, high level math or advanced languages, whatever. There's just all these assumptions about who's smart, who can study what, who belongs and what roles in our society. And what we've seen in you know, the work you're doing in, in the Bard Prison Initiative experience is that we have to throw all that away. We just have to. And I, I'm optimistic because this is a, a huge moment, really. And there's a huge responsibility to kind of hold our um, public officials' feet to the fire and our academic institutions' feet to the fire. You know, so unfortunately, I think there are many, many uh, colleges and, and liberal arts institutions and otherwise that aren't, don't feel that they are responsible in this um, Part, that they don't see this as part of their responsibility as civic institutions. And it, I, I feel so strongly that it is. And well, I commend Pitzer for what you're doing, as I said, for that reason. Oh, I think uh, I think your work is kind of push a lot of institutions to think along these lines. So, uh, but uh, anyway, at, that, at this point, it might be a, a good moment to go to our fourth and last um, uh, clip. And then after that, we'll be going to the questions. So again, if people want to pose questions uh, um, in the Q&A function, uh, um, and uh, again, I have some questions from, from our institute students as well, but we'll go now to our, our last clip. And if, if I could, I just um, would just say this is the very end of the film. So it is a bit of a spoiler, but we felt it was Really, we want to share it with all of you because, you know, this is the end of college, what should happen. And it was a really beautiful um, moment to be able to share. My last visit, my mother was saying she wasn't coming and she didn't know how she was going to get because she didn't want to drive. She still had the same attitude this morning. My sister drove, so she came, and I'm very happy that she came along with my daughter because I want my daughter to be able to see that if I can do this in here, there's no reason why she can't do it out there. And knowing that they're here to support me and I go home in two weeks really, really means a lot. 
earning my degree is my right to take off the summer. I'm not even gonna take no classes this summer. I'ma just chill. But <laughs> I saw one of the classes for the summer was environmental science and it's a 300 level class. So I'm kind of like, I don't think I could pass it up. I just, I don't, I don't think I could. So it's like, it never ends. It never ends for me. Rika, I'm going to watch a Kathy Gowan. You see it? You about uh, to have yours on too. Uh, Nice. Oh, <laughs> ah. Yo, I see your mama out there. You yeah. seen her yet? Yeah. No. I see your mama and your daughter. Oh, I miss you. I miss you too. For those of us who are in this racket of uh, educating people. We rarely get uh, the sense of pride about how important it is to get an education. I speak for all the faculty when I say that the students in BPI represent the hardest working, most dedicated, and most inspiring students we have. To my family, it means the world to me that you have come out to show support. Mom, I love you. I told you I would make you proud one day. And to my brother Jonah, whose life was cut short before he could even walk the stage, I'm wearing his bow tie for him. Jonah, this is for you. When you're inside, you always hear people talk about the day they go home. For some, that's true. They are going home, back to family, back to where they were before they arrived at the kind I'm sorry. But I don't have my idea of home. Not just yet. Home for me is now a journey. Home is a work in progress. Home is a choice. Choice. The choice to think for yourself. The choice to push through and succeed. Inside the walls of the classroom, you escape the walls of a cell, and you become an individual again. And though I may still be figuring out what home will be for me, I can say with pride and certainty that I'm already part of a family. Congratulations to you, to us, to my BPI sisters. <laughs> Shantae L. Montgomery. BPI for me is giving me like a new, a new pair of eyes to really recognize certain cycles in life and how I just don't want to be a part of certain things anymore. Graduation, I think humanized like a lot of us. It made us feel like we belonged again. It was like, uh, I don't know, it was something like utopia. Upon being released, I wanted to go to grad school, but grad school is expensive. For too long, I have been assisted by my dad. I mean, I'm 26 years old now, and he's been supporting me for 10 years, and I can't wait to just go home and just support him for once. Daiwan A. Tetro. It's a privilege to have a bar and associate's degree. And not everybody in prison gets this opportunity so to walk across stage. Rodney J. Jones. <laughs> Sebastian Taewoo Yu.
I am thinking about going to law school. I don't know if that opportunity would be, will be available to me, but it's certainly something that I'm passionate about right now. To have him talk about having a future outside of those prison walls is like the best thing ever. So he wants to go to law school, which means he has a plan, he has a goal to make it through. And that there's a possibility that I'm not gonna receive a horrible phone call saying something happened to him, saying that he, someone done something to him or he's done something to himself because it's just too much for him. He has hope and he just can't wait to do something with the remaining of his life and to help people. This is a new phase of my life. I'm almost out the door. That means I have five more years until I go to the parole board. I wish I could just fast forward the time and just see him get out and see the things that he's, he's gonna accomplish. That's great, and I think those clips gave you the kind of the full arc of, of the, the evolution of the, of the film there, but, uh, but really um, terrific stuff. Um, so we're gonna to go to uh, Q&A um, now, and we had hoped originally to involve some of our inside uh, students uh, in this panel uh, directly uh, today, but that turned out not to be possible. Uh, but those students have viewed uh, uh, the film uh, and they've sent me some questions to pose to Jewel and to Lynn. And a recording of this session is also gonna be shared with the inside uh, students. And we are, are intending to have a couple of follow-up events to this uh, panel, so future panels, in which we do hope to involve our, our inside um, students. Um, so I'll uh, start with uh, uh, one uh, question from an inside student. This is from Yusuf, um, and uh, I guess this is primarily to Lynn, but looking back on the film now, uh, what is the one thing you wish you had done differently? <laughs> oh, I think, you know, um, I think uh, we always like to say you don't um, complete a work of art, you just abandon it. At a certain point, you just have to stop because you just can't do everything. So that's an impossible question. We had, there's whole storylines we weren't able to include. Um, some of my favorite classes didn't make it into the film, but you know, I think we're really happy with how it turned out. And um, I think, you know, it's just a series of making a lot of choices to tell this story. So I, I can't really, I wish we could have had six more hours to keep following people. I think that's one thing I will say, we wanted to spend more time showing the experiences post-incarceration but that might be um, another movie because it, it's such a rich story to tell and people want to know what happens to people after, you know, and we have, Jewel was nice enough and kind of let us film him as he was um, being released. And we had about a year or so, but then, you know, we had to finish the film. And so if that, I think that would be a great opportunity to keep the story going. So, Thanks. So I have a question here, and I'd be interested in both of your responses to this. This is from an inside student, uh, Damien. And what's the level of cooperation with prison staff during uh, this project? So I'd like Lynn's perspective on this and then also Jules. Well, um, we could not have made this film without the cooperation of prison staff. Absolutely not possible. And, you know, we had very high level clearance from the governor's office to come in with our cameras there were restrictions about what we could and couldn't film for security reasons is what they usually said. And, but otherwise we really, as long as we mapped it out and planned ahead what we wanted to do, what happened is we really started off, we're just gonna be on the school floor, which is the, you know, that hallway that you saw. And as we got to know the students better, we realized, well, I think we need to try to show our viewers where people live and what their life is like outside of the school floor. Because if you just see the school floor, you don't really always realize that you're in, inside a prison. So we, you know, after a year of filming, we asked, well, could we film in the yard? Could we film people in their cells? Could we film here? Could we film there? And it was over time, we kept asking for more and more. And I think that really had to do with them keeping an eye on us and seeing that we were, um, you know, uh, respectful of the rules, which I think you just have to be there. So, yeah. Yeah, I would just say that it was diverse. Of course, there was one officer or this person who gave me the impression that 
uh, there was some type of animosity about me taking these college classes or trying to make sure I didn't think that I was entitled to privileges because I was taking college classes. But I would say overall, there was support. There was support to the same level as Lynn described. As long as we followed the rules, people encouraged us to be doing the right thing. Thanks. Um, there's actually one question from a viewer, Carolyn Richter, that I'd love to jump on myself if, uh, if I can uh, take advantage of my moderator status here. But during this time of COVID, are the incarcerated students taking the exact same virtual classes uh, at the same time as PITSA students? And the answer to that is yes. We had four last semester, five this semester, and uh, devising how to do that and how to do small group activities, for example, in the context of a, of a Zoom class, has been a challenge, but we've had some of the most creative faculty in Claremont um, uh, working on this. And I'll point out too, I think all uh, outside students are complaining of Zoom fatigue. Our inside students uh, have Zoom hunger. They love it. This is, uh, again, the, uh, given the conditions in the last year, people have been cut off from family visits and things like this. The, 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 acts, the ability to talk to one another and to uh, out, outside students via Zoom has just been uh, um, uh, really appreciated by, by our, our inside students. So, uh, I, but I did just want to uh, jump on that one uh, myself. Could I, could I just also add, however, I'm so, I would love to connect with you, Nigel, and see how you got that done. But the harsh reality is that isn't the situation across the nation. Uh, people aren't allowed to, the, to not even in some cases have that the technology, not to mention, like I said earlier, the infrastructure of prisons aren't really uh, capable of taking on that type of responsibility. And there's just one third thing that I want to lift up that I think is a, a very uh, valid uh, pushback. Many practitioners feel if that if, the, if, if things become too technical, then in-person learning, which is a standard of quality, not the standard, but is a standard of quality, there's this impression that correction was, would say, hey, if you could do it on a video, why do we need you to come inside and, and teach? Amen uh, to that. And we are completely committed to going back face-to-face. Uh, uh, -face. And we've made this very clear to er everyone that um, uh, we're uh, working this with. So I, I think that that's a, a, that's a really important um, point. So um, uh, let me go to another question from um, uh, an inside uh, uh, student. Reggie uh, is asked, uh, uh, asked a question. If we liken education as a pathway to freedom, as education frees us from the subservient behaviors and attitudes that have been endemic in not just our personal lives, but our, our society's culture through various uh, popularized uh, discourse, how or what would you suggest is needed to make education more readily available uh, to institutions for the incarcerated population? Ooh. <laughs> I love, uh, this guy here is a, a, a deep thinker. I love you, Reggie. That's a great question. Um, there's so much. It's, it's, there's levels of this, but I think we have touched on it in many, in, in many ways already. Uh, I think we do need a hybrid form of uh, delivery models that employs uh, both technology and in-person learning to allow uh, college to be more readily accessible. Um, but I think you're also talking here about uh, the content and the quality of the education as well. Uh, I would say that, you know, I'm a liberal arts promoter. Uh, I actually didn't like the liberal arts until I got into school and uh, realized that in, in something like German, in my German classes, I learned about mechanics. You can learn about everything through liberal arts, but I, I, one of the most popular ways I think that you're talking about, and that is that liberatory education, we need not only uh, 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 liberal arts, but identity-based education. There's a, a subtle reality that most of the people doing this work in prison are you know, predominantly white people we need to have more representations of people of color and that will be a liberatory practice in this field as well. I uh, agree very strongly with that. And I'm actually pleased that uh, here at, within Claremont, we've mainly drawn a lot of the younger faculty across the five C's and we have that diversity represented in our faculty cohort, but, uh, which is not, as you point out, typically true um, uh, around the country. So um, 
but um, I have a question here from another uh, inside student, Jeremy. Um, and um, in what ways does the College Behind Bar Bars platform allow its incarcerated participants the option to operate as a College Behind Bars member group uh, upon release? And I think what Jeremy's driving at here is kind of, is there a cohort effect with the students that were involved in the film? And where uh, this is, he may be yeah. thinking about this because we're working on the, the kind of cohort model here or the posse model yes. with a, a group of students. Yeah, I mean, it, that's been a really wonderful experience, I think, for everybody involved in the film. Most of the people that you saw graduate in that last scene are no longer incarcerated. Just Rodney, who was talking about how he has, he now only has a few more months before he goes to the parole board. So he will soon be hopefully coming home as well. But as people have come home and we were getting ready to release the film, we've developed a model, definitely. We had lots of um, internal meetings all together with the alums who were in the film who are no longer incarcerated. And then as you know, uh, planning events, and sort of talking points and how to sort of spread the word and what's the most effective use of everybody's time. And we've, we, we used to get together before COVID and just sort of, you know, shared the experience of sharing the film and doing different kinds of events like this in, in person. But now with, um, obviously with COVID, we're doing more virtual events, but it's been a wonderful, I think, experience for everybody to kind of stay connected to each other and to the film. And not everyone in the film necessarily knew each other while incarcerated. But now, right, so Jewel, I mean, one, one of my favorite moments of finishing the film was we were having a screening um, for everybody who was in the film to see it before it was put out. And Shantae, who you just saw give the beautiful speech, she was kind of in the front row with Tamika and um, Tamara, who you saw. And Jewel was late and he came in at the end. And so the lights came up and then she realized Jewel was in the room. And she didn't realize, you know, Anyway, it was just a moment of Jewel is here. Wow, you know. So I think there was just a sense of real connection. Jewel should speak more about this, but it's been really, really fun. Yes, I would just say quickly, you know, the fraternity, the the, the way we've connected is phenomenal. Shantae is definitely a close friend now. Uh, but I want I want to also flag that while the College Behind Bars platform definitely has a role in the way we're keeping in contact with us, the education itself also played a role. Because I know when I was released, what helped me with my integration in society was the fact that a lot of my classmates had been released already. And they were telling me, Jewel, this is where you need to go to get your ID. Jewel, this is what you have to do. So I would encourage you to realize that the, those brothers and sisters that you are in those classes with right now are going to be the people who form your network once you're released. And that's true for your um, on-campus students at Pitzer, right? I mean, your college friends or your friends, you know, or the connection to your college when you meet someone outside who went to Pitzer and you realize, oh, we have this in common. And Bard has a wonderful alumni um, network also, separate from the film, nothing to do with the film. So there's a very vital alumni network that informal and formal, which is really, really important. A um, uh, quick question here that I, I guess I better let Lynn answer rather than myself, that there are people asking, how can we watch the whole series? And yes, I'm worried, okay, great. I'm worried I'll give the wrong answer. We can, well, we can put it in the chat, but it's available in many different places. It's streaming on pbs.org. So you can just search College Behind Bars PBS. The whole film is there for free. It's also on Netflix and it's also on Amazon. There's a Ken Burns kind of section of Amazon that's a documentary channel that's actually a subscription. So that you'd have to pay a little bit for, or you can watch it on iTunes, but pbs.org it's free and no, there's no paywall. So that's, that's what we recommend. So, yeah. But Nigel, what you're talking about people who are incarcerated, how could they watch? Oh, them? Oh. Um, well, no, uh, this, this was a question from an outside person, but, but you raise a very important question and, uh, uh, very early on, uh, I, I was in touch with Lynn and she very kindly sent me multiple copies uh, of the, uh, the film. And so that one of those made th their way into CRC, but also two other facilities that we're, we have class, uh, classes going on in, uh, as well. So yes, so, we yes, uh, we tried. We, we definitely want people incarcerated to be able to see the film. So we've given away 400 copies of the film to different college and prison programs and also to just corrections departments. And hopefully it's, you know, and it's also on tablets. Um, some of the tablet systems, which we're not huge fans of, but we want the film to be there, so. Yeah, so um, I've uh, asked you another question from our inside student Yusuf uh, here, who's in a, a course being taught by Professor Smith over at CMC this semester on film, on African-American film, but uh, uh, Yusuf asked, I'm a docu-film junkie. What advice do you have for someone who wants to produce their own film? That's great. 
Jewel, you want to take that? <laughs> I, I don't know. I can't I think I'll leave that one to you. Lady. Okay. Um, I mean, I think, you know, I started as an intern basically. And I, you know, I think that's a, a good, just if you're, but when I started, there weren't nearly as many opportunities as there are now. So um, watch a lot of documentaries and see which ones you like and try to get a sense of what kind of um, approaches are interesting to you. And then, you know, you probably have to get a little bit of training of some sort, um, either academic or on the job training to really have some um, traction essentially. But, but look, the, the means of production are very democratic these days. You could take this right here and make a documentary with it and people do. And they're really good sometimes. So, you know, there are the, the um, if you have a story you want to tell, I sometimes think maybe it's better to start with audio because it's just less complicated. You know, there's so many great podcasts. Just try to come up with how to tell a story just with sound. And then you can figure out pictures later because that's like a layers of meaning that it gets more complicated. Okay, I'm gonna answer one last question briefly and then maybe if each of our panelists would like to offer us a uh, 30 second final words of wisdom, but from Vishy Pusala, thought provoking video. Uh, how does this experience compare with people, adolescents, older people in residential care facilities? Uh, I, I'm very interested in that question myself. Here in, in Claremont, we actually have uh, Napier courses that connect with a local retirement uh, community, mm -hmm. which has proved really interesting because uh, part of the 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 the, the uh, great attributes of these inside out classes it, it's it's you're you're having people from different generations talk to one another. We talk about diversity in the classroom, but intergenerational diversity is something that that happens uh, in inside out classes, but has also happened with these uh, Napier classes. And I think that that's a, a key ingredient in uh, the uh, uh, learning across different. Uh, a pedagogy that, that is uh, really uh, comes to the fore in, in, uh, in courses like this. But, um, but with that, again, uh, uh, I would like to invite uh, perhaps each of our four panelists, if they would like to, to offer a final word uh, of uh, uh, wisdom uh, or, or, uh, or, or whatever they would do wish to offer before, before we sign off here. So uh, would anyone like to start? Okay, everybody's being so polite. I'll just jump in to get this going. Yes, I just wanna say thank you, Nigel, and thank you to everyone at Pitzer for um, this really amazing event and to the inside students for sh sending questions. And I'm sorry that we couldn't meet you in person, but we definitely like to come back when that is possible and you know, see what you're, participate a little bit more in the program that you're, that you're running because it's incredibly important and a great model for our whole country to see. So thank you. And, and I'll jump in quickly and say, thank you everyone. Uh, I've done a lot of screenings and public talk, but this was one of the most engaging. I really love the questions as well as being able to connect with Michael and Leanne. So thank you so much. I'm gonna put Jewel on the spot here. I, I want you to come and speak to my class with our inside students. Give me a yes, please. Yes, yes, let's do it. Thank you, Jewel. Leanne? I just want to thank everyone on the panel, um, all those that are um, online listening and to the inside students. And then one word of wisdom, maybe um, just no matter what barriers we have in our way, we should not allow that to stop us from pursuing our goals. I'm 50 years old and going to be graduating to getting my um, bachelor's in psychology. And then I'm going to go on for my master's. So no matter what, we just need to just hang in there and just stay motivated and thankful to those that are in support of us. Thank you. Thank you, Nigel, for everything that you've done, Lynn and Jewel and Leanne and everyone watching. Thank you for giving me the space. Um, I just feel like, you know, it's, it's, it's good to emphasize, you know, the empowerment of education and then what it, what it can do as, as you're, uh, Lynn's documentary is it, so eloquently, you know, documented, you know, there's no limit to the potential that exists inside and, and even outside, you know, so the, the flourishment of these programs are, you know, vital in, in, in changing the narrative around criminal justice and criminal justice reform. Um, thank you. And that's a perfect note on which to finish. Thank you, uh, Michael. Thank you, everybody. Uh, and as has already been noted, we are planning follow-up events um, uh, um, uh, uh, like this. So uh, we look forward to inviting you to those. But uh, thanks, everybody, and uh, uh, enjoy the rest of your weekend. Goodbye. <laughs>